Thank you, everyone. Can you can you all hear me? I'm just going to take a second to get myself settled because if I stand up too long, I faint. It tends to alarm my audiences. <laughs> um, I'm going to talk a little bit um, about the inspiration for the book and then meeting the apes, and then do a very short reading. And with a, a crowd of this size, I love to do Q and A because I find that is the most fun. Sorry. Um, should I rock star it? Yeah. <laughs> I'll try not to slobber on it. <laughs> the idea for this book came to me about um, about four years ago, right? When I was going to go on tour for Water for Elephants. And my mother sent me an email with a link uh, to the Great Ape Trust site. And the Great Ape Trust is in Des Moines, Iowa. And it, can you, do you have a trouble hearing me? Still okay. I don't know how much closer I can get. <laughs> Let me just see. If, let's get the technical stuff out of the way. Then I'll start with the story. I can hold it too with this. Hello? Oops. I don't want to deafen people either. Okay, so summarizing the first sentence um, I got a link to the Great Eight Trust's website, and I was doubly fascinated. I don't want the feedback either. Neither do you, trust me. I'm, 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 I couldn't be without <laughs> being married to it in some stage. <laughs> um, so I went, I, I followed the link to the Great Eight Trust website and I, I was doubly fascinated by what I found there because I have been uh, fascinated with the concept of, oh wait, I have to start over just, I will come back to this, but thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for coming out and supporting your local independent bookstore. by the Great Hit Trust website because I have been fascinated since 1980 with the, with the concept of human ape discourse, being able to converse with apes in human language, or really in any way language, but um, frankly, they're the only ones who've come over to our side. We haven't managed to come over to theirs yet. But starting with Coco the Gorilla, I've been very fascinated with the idea of language and cognition ability in great apes. And the second reason I was so fascinated was because I never heard of bonobos before. And I don't know how many of you have, I, I'm gonna guess that in Asheville more people have heard of bonobos than, than in, in many places. But they have a very unique culture. For many years they were considered to be a subspecies of chimpanzee, and they're not. And although they appear very similar to chimpanzees with some differences, they have a very distinct um, hairstyle they have black hair parted straight down the center, and that's just the way they're born. They just, they have that hairstyle. Uh, they look sort of like the ballet dancers of chimpanzees. They have long limbs, they're a little bit smaller, they're, um, they're frankly, a little more elegant. But they're also matriarchal, egalitarian, peaceful, and very, very amorous. <laughs> Put it mildly. Um, to put it more succinctly, the average bonobo initiates some kind of sexual contact every hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, I, I was obviously, I thought this had great possibilities. <laughs> um, so, I, I really, I didn't think that I could do these apes justice without going out and meeting them, and so I, I wrote to the trust and I asked if I could come and visit. And I guess a lot of people want to come and visit the trust. And so they sent me stacks of homework. And to meet people out, they, they do. They just they send you stacks of work. And I, um, I went through all, the, all of the articles in scientific journals, and then I um, had to go uh, fly to Toronto to York University and do a crash course in linguistics. And uh, after I did all the homework, I was like, OK, I've done my homework. Can I come visit? And they said, sure. But that doesn't mean you're going to get to meet the apes, because that's up to the apes. And so, um, like the guy in my book, I bought backpacks for each of the apes, and I researched each of them personally and discovered what their 
favorite foods were, what their favorite toys were, and then I did add-ons. I tried to think of anything and everything that might possibly be fun or amusing or tasty to an ape. So I included Rubik's Cubes, Slinkies, Mr. Potato Heads, Bouncy Balls, <laughs> M&Ms, which was probably the greatest thing I did. Um, and when I, when I went, I, I sent an email to the scientists ahead of time saying, um, could you please, please tell the apes that I'm bringing surprises? And so I got there and I went through the orientation and then I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And they're like, do you know that? And I'm like, yeah, I read the books. Um, <laughs> will the apes see me? And so they went off and consulted the apes and the apes came back and the, the, the word was, not only are they saying, yes, they will see you, they are insisting. <laughs> <laughs> And so I went, I went into the back, and I, I, um, I first met with Kanzi, who uh, is kind of the rock star of the Great Ape Trust, and he knows it. And <laughs> he, he likes to show up, and he, he, he's very language competent. These apes use um, a series of lexigrams, which are pictorial representations of words, to, uh, to communicate in human language. They, they understand many, many hundreds of human, I mean, basically you speak to them as I am speaking to you now and they understand. Their vocabulary for responding is only limited by the number of lexigrams on their board because their vocal tract is not shaped in a way that allows them to speak human language. But even so, their lexigram board has almost 400 symbols on it. And it includes tenses and, you know, I, I just wasn't expecting that. But so Kanzi came out and he was sure I'll I'll talk to you and I'll I'll play music with you and he's he's played he's recorded with Peter Gabriel and <laughs> he really is a rock star. <laughs> um, and so that was that was great. And then then I met his sister Pandanisha, who is actually sort of secretly known to be more linguistically competent even than her brother. But Pam Benicia is, is um, picky and she doesn't show off and she will not talk to you unless she likes you and she's very careful about who she picks and who she likes. And she does not like to feel like she's on display. And so if you, if you are viewing her as an exhibit, she's nah, nah, not gonna happen. Um, I knew that Pam Benicia liked dogs but didn't like cats and I knew that she was a mother, and I'm a mother, and I had never had a conversation with an ape before, obviously, so I, I, as icebreakers, I brought pictures of my dogs and pictures of my kids, and um, I showed her the picture of my dogs, and nothing, even though she has two dogs, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and I showed her a picture of my three children when they were much, much younger and in a very deep bubble bath, and um, she went to her computer and said, "Babies washing bubbles," Aww. and that was the first. That was the first kind of icebreaker and moment of two-way conversation I'd had, and it was truly magical. And I spent the rest of the afternoon there, um, Pamela and I just really hit it off. And by the time that the scientists were ready to leave and go home for dinner, they kind of dragged me out of there, and the bonobos were, "No, no, you got to come and meet our mother and the playground." Um, the day after, when I had left, Pambanesha said to one of the scientists, where's Sarah? Build her nest. When's she coming back? Aww. So naturally, I sent her a Fruit of the Month club. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, you know, I, it wasn't necessary. It was, I mean, it, she, they, they like it. It's Sarah's special fruit, and it comes every month. But. Um, but they would have rem remembered me anyway. And the next time I went to visit, uh, Pam Benicia knew that I had dedicated this book to her. And so she was feeling very special because Kanzi, who is the rock star, usually gets all the attention. And so Pam Benicia, there was a, there was a film crew there, and Pam Benicia heard that I was getting my makeup done ahead of time. And well, she wanted her makeup done. So the, the makeup, that we, we were climbing over fences and into the backyard, and Pam Benicia and I got our makeup done together, and she wore beautiful, perfect purple lipstick, and she had powdered her cheeks. And, um, and she, I, I, I don't know whether to preface this, but I'm going to tell you ahead of time. It, the, the bonobos were a little bit overweight, and so they were on diets, Tuesdays and Thursdays. This was a Tuesday. 
So Pam Benicia um, invited me to a tea party in the forest. And she has a kitchen at the Creative Trust. She makes her own ramen noodles, she works at gas range. So she, <laughs> she made the tea, she chose Earl Grey for me and Black Grey for her. She had been saving her cookies for a week because she knew I was coming. And she set up the blankets and she set up the cookies and she set up the teapots. And we sat up there and, um, and she asked me if I wanted some milk for my tea. 